Thank you for all of this. And uh, okay, so so I will start. You don't hear me? Ah, uh, I don't know what to do. And now, do you hear me? Well, yeah, key. No, it's fine. Okay. So I start. Let me try to explain what I will try to do. When it's over that way, I. Uh, what's wrong? <laughs> Uh, high tech is not yet. Uh, uh, I will try. No. Well, I'm tired to say things, right? <laughs> Again, yeah. <laughs> Not an infinite amount of things I can put in this pocket. Oh, I can get. <laughs> okay, so let me, as I said, first try to say what I'm going to say, well, I'm going to talk about physics, of course, well, and fundamental physics. Physics, fundamental physics, the way it is conceived today, we intend to interpret the diverse phenomena in nature as particular representation of general laws. Now, since the inception of these ideas, which starts from the Italian Renaissance, to now, and particularly due to the impressive realization in the first half of the, of the 20th century, uh, it uh, really became conceivable that all phenomena, from the scale of the atom to the edge of the visible universe, could be accounted for by two fundamental laws, and only two, and two known laws. Essentially, general relativity, which is the generalization by Einstein of uh, the theory of gravity of, of uh, Newton, and quantum electrodynamics, which is the quantum version of Maxwell's electromagnetic theory. Gravity and electromagnetism are long-range interaction, meaning they act on objects no matter how far they're separated from each other. But the development and the knowledge about the structure at smaller scale at the atom, nuclei and the um, some nuclear objects, uh, reveal the existence of short range forces which, at larger scale, had practically no influence at all. And in the beginning of the 60s, the theory of such short-range fundamental interaction seems to pose insuperable obstacles. Inspired by Nambu's work on spontaneous symmetry breaking, in 64 brought myself and Higgs showed that uh, well, invented, if you wish, the possibility of having scalar boson which condense to pervade, to form a condensate which pervades the universe. And the properties of this condensate showed that it was possible to devise a mechanism by which short range forces arise by phenomena similar to phase transition out of long range forces. And that has important, has important uh, implication, as we should see. And uh, at the same time, it gave the dynamic, actually, 
any direction, provided, of course, we assume the system is infinite to avoid surface effect, and we assume that it's not uh, in interaction with some external field like the magnetic field of the Earth. And so, at high temperature, the system, the system is in center of symmetric phase because in the average it is rotationally invariant, but that symmetry is spontaneously broken at a sufficiently low temperature. Now, <coughs> there is one point here which is important, that it's a continuous symmetry. In other words, uh, the, the rotation form a continuous symmetry, and that has a consequence in physics. Suppose I orient half the spin with respect to the other, I can even leave, contrary to what's hidden, what's uh, on the blackboard, I can leave one of the spin just untouched, and half of them I, I rotate. That costs energy, it's obviously an excitation. But it's an excitation that costs very low energy, essentially a surface energy. Why? Because if I rotate everything, because the system is a spontaneous breaking, whether it's oriented that way or that way is the same energy, so this can only cost the energy, which is very small in the region where spin rub each other. Say, and then I can go on and do this. Right. What I've done is constructed a wave. I've constructed a wave which going from low, mom, low wavelength to large momentum, going back, I see that in the limit of large momentum, that wave, that mode, contains essentially zero energy. So that means that quantum mechanically, if you wish, the bosons, which are the constituent of that wave that the boson here must have zero mass. They would have zero mass if I would be in vacuum. Of course, this is not here zero mass. Essentially, I will put mass in the quotation mark because this is essentially a massless mode. It has zero energy at very large wavelengths. Of course, there is also a mode which is massive. This is the one which just corresponds to stretching the spins, in other words, which measures the rigidity of this condensate of uh, spins in one direction. This is uh, a mode which I can write in the same way, but just stretching, it's nothing to do with the symmetry. And that one, of course, if I go backwards from this to this, at the end I have just to stretch the thing, and uh, that costs energy. Right. Now, now <coughs> let's do this a little bit more technically and also more generally. So I have here, well, first, so the fact that we have a continuous symmetry to remind us, remind us that there should be some massless quotation mark boson into the problem. And the vacuum rigidity, vacuum meaning the lowest energy possible, uh, is measured by the mass of these massive bosons corresponding to these things. Now, how does that work more uh, quantitatively? Well, suppose I compute the uh, Gibbs free energy per spin in the limit of a large number of spins. At high temperature, in the BMZ plane, there is only a minimum at zero magnetization, which is the uh, equilibrium position. Now, of course, I can rotate that in transverse thing, but of course, the zero magnetization remains zero magnetization at that minimum. So there's just one minimum, and the system has no magnetization. If, the, if, however, I uh, lower the temperature below, be, below some critical point, which is called the Curie point, then the thing develops a double minimum in the VMZ plane, 
like in any second, okay, most any order, well, in any second order phase transition. And then I can go in all the transverse way, and you see that uh, um, then if I go along the valley, it costs no energy, but if I climb the potential, it costs energy. So if I put myself in a magnetization along MZ, turning around the, along the green arrow means essentially taking the zero, li the large wavelength limit of a spin waves and uh, or of a massless mode, while the other course to the existence of the massive mode. This is just climbing the potential. And uh, so these are the thing. And that can be generalized to second order phase transition, generally. And uh, except that there is one problem. So the massless boson here is the ancestor, as we shall see, to what in field theory it's called the number Goldstone boson. Massive boson is the ancestor to what is sometimes called the BEH boson, sometimes also, I and mean, often one dropped the continental part of it, but, uh, uh, well, whatever it is, it's the ancestor of what we shall see it is. And uh, so, but there is an exception, as I said. The exception is that superconductivity, where the massless mode is actually observed absorbed in the massive plasma mode. And uh, this, at first sight, is due to electromagnetic interaction, to the electrostatic interactions, like the plasma itself. And uh, so that is true, actually. There is a deeper explanation that we should see later. Now, that is for uh, phase transition. But the important point is that Nambu made this wonderful work to uh, the of massless fermion. Massless fermion essentially are two uh, neutrinos, the right handed and the left handed one which propagate without interaction. Therefore, the phase, the quantum phase between these two neutrinos is arbitrary. And, and therefore, there is a symmetry. That's the U1 symmetry, called the chiral symmetry. So if you put an interaction which preserves the chiral symmetry, and that's very easy to do, then, of course, the electron or the, pro, or the uh, fermion in general remains massless, except, except of course, if the symmetry is spontaneously broken. Like the rotation is broken in the ferromagnetism, this U1 can be broken. And then Nambu showed that this gives rise to a pseudoscalar particle, which he identified to the chiral limit of the pi on. and this was a great breakthrough in physics. And uh, he also showed with Jean Boulon and uh, with uh, John Alassigno, he also showed that there was also scalar boson in it, which was related to the mass that has been generated by spontaneous symmetry breaking. But I will not discuss this. Instead, I will take a simpler model which is easier to understand and essentially, which is after all, maybe closer to what we need now. And this is the uh, Goldstone model, which is also a U1 symmetry. But it's the U1 symmetry of a complex field, where I've written here the Lagrangian and the potential. You see, obviously, that this is invariant under uh, a rotation of the phase. Now, the symmetry is broken once you put a non-vanishing expectation value for the uh, field phi. Uh, writing phi as the expectation value plus some quantum fluctuation. Uh, that is 
uh, easily seen if you replace phi, if you write phi, rather, in terms of its real component, then the potential which is there is given by this uh, Mexican head type of picture. And you see that I can put uh, on the valley which is there drawn in blue, I can put the minimum anywhere. There's a valley of minimum very similar to the valley of minimum in the ferromagnetic case. And uh, I can put it in phi 1, which plays then the role, the expectation value of phi 1 plays the role of the magnetization, if you wish, and the rotation along the phi, uh, along the blue line, may be viewed as the uh, <coughs> large wavelength limit of a massless boson, which is the massless number goldstone boson in that case. Climbing the potential is the massless limit of the scalar boson. Both these effects can be trivially verified by computing the second derivative of the potential. Now, this is very easy, but it's very profound. And it's good to have in mind that this is nothing else that what we already said in terms of intuitive things, because that sometimes spares a lot of unnecessary computation. So the, here uh, I have drawn the condensate here, like in the same way as I've drawn the spin in the ferromagnetic phase, and uh, with the exception that the arrows are blue. That the arrows are blue and not red, that's because here it's not, they are not in space. They are in the phi 1, phi 2 plane. Right? So that, uh, what you call an internal symmetry. It's in the phi 1, phi 2 plane, and, uh, but uh, that doesn't change. The second line is what I said before, and that also cost energy, but what, so I not repeat the thing. So this is the graphical view or the intuitive view of what the nambu goldstone boson is, and it's essentially similar to what happens in the ferromagnet for the spin waves. There are little differences, but not going to focus on that. And also, of course, we have the massive moon. So now, to start, to, to summarize, the U1 symmetry, which was here the phase transition, is spontaneously broken by the condensate, which is formed by these uh, bosons, and it gives a degenerate vacuum where I can choose any orientation along that valley or any orientation in the drawing of this uh, blue arrows in the 5 one by 2 plane. And as previously, the massless Nambu Goldstone boson characterized the condensate, a continuous uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking, while the massive scalar boson measures the rigidity of the vacuum, as before. So now we are ready to go a little bit further and go to the BEH mechanism. Well, the U1 symmetry that we had Another way to state it was that I could transform phi into phi times the exponential of any uh, number, and that doesn't change anything. But the number is a constant in space-time. Now so suppose that the number is still, is now a depend on space-time. So now this has become a local symmetry because I can now vary the spin orientation locally, the blue spins, <laughs> the one of the thing. And now, this can be done at the expense of inventing a field it's called the gauge field, which is a mu here, and replacing the derivative of phi with a covariant derivative, which is defined in the second line here, right? Now, if you look at the two first term of the modified Lagrangian where you just replace the derivative by the covariant derivative, that represents something, a theory, which is now locally symmetric and which the local goldstone 
U1 symmetry. But of course, you have introduced a new field. You want it to have also kinetic energy, so introduce the field strength of mu nu, which is still invariant. And then you see this Lagrangian, which is there, is now has a dynamical new field in it, and then it is invariant and the local U1 symmetry. Why are we interested in that? Well, we are interested in that because now forget the potential. What is there is just a Lagrangian of the Maxwell theory view quantum mechanically, if you wish, of a electromagnetic field coupled to a charged scalar field, the charge being represented by the complex phi. And so you see, now comes the very f important fact that previously to have done uh, uh, short range interaction, the fundamental interaction that we knew, gravity and electromagnetism, were theories which satisfy the local symmetry. And so, at least if I remember the way things were at that time, looking for fundamental symmetry, we, we had the impression that this has to be a local symmetry. There was no complete the uh, logical reason for it, but we had the impression that it should be. There was some experimental reason to go into something similar to electromagnetism, but fundamentally we had that reason. But of course this is not enough, because we know that uh, uh, this is something in which the photon is not charged, and we are interested in transmitting charged objects. So, we decided to generalize this to what is well known, even at that time, which is the Yang-Mills theory, which is the same thing for not an abelian local symmetry, which is a U1 symmetry, but a general symmetry for any group, any semi-simple group. And uh, for the moment, this is just a set of indices. And the reason why we were interested in that, already at that time, if I remember correctly, is that despite the fact that uh, electromagnetism and gravity are both local symmetry, the local symmetry of gravity is much more complicated and doesn't lead to a consistent theory at the quantum level why electromagnetism does. So this was as close as we could be from the uh, electromagnetic theory. So we consider the idea of a non-abelian local symmetry, and we are going to do something like the uh, Goldstone boson coupled to something, not only the Goldstone boson, but I mean the Goldstone model coupled to something like non-abelian symmetry. So how does that work? Now here, I will expose our approach to the problem. What we did is, of course, first, let's suppose we just do the Goldstone model, the U1 symmetry, local. Then it's the same thing, but the covariant derivative gives you an interaction with the electromagnetic field, actually a trilinear and a quartic interaction, and we break the symmetry we're the same way as in the Goldstone model. But I put a quotation mark in broken, and that we'll discuss in a moment. So you do that, and then you compute the Feynman diagrams. You're, here time goes from left to right, and these lines are propagators. I am not going to discuss in detail what that means, but uh, the propagator has the property that Define that the denominator goes to zero at the value of the mass. Now, Q squared here is in the four dimension, means Q zero squared, which is the energy squared minus four momentum squared. So here, clearly, the denominator vanishes where the energy is proportional to the momentum, meaning that the particle has zero mass. Then, generally, the numerator 
describes the spin of the particle and the polarizations, but there is an arbitrariness here because the gauge field which is there, we have seen, has a large possible invariance, and we choose one gauge, which is that's the, what on calls taking one of this arbitrary uh, value for the potential, and uh, this is the one which is transverse, meaning that Q mu multiplied by the denominator gives zero. Uh, you can add also a longitudinal part, as we'll see in a moment, doesn't matter. But I don't want to go too technical in this, but uh, I just want to show, to say that this is the choice of a gauge which is very similar to electrodynamics when you uh, can, uh, when you use to derive the validity of it quantum mechanically. I will come back to this. So, um, so this is the propagator we choose. It's a Lando gauge, called the Lando gauge. And then we computed these two lowest order graphs, which are here. And it's not very difficult to see that this one gives this term. And this one propagates, actually, the Alston boson in this theory. And the two things make that this has this particular form, which is transverse. Now that is something that one calls in field theory a word identity. It is something that shows that the symmetry has not been broken. It means the gauge invariance is still there. And despite the fact that you do you choose a particular gauge, let's say a particular value of the AMU, which you have the right to do. Uh, so what's new? Well, what's new is that the pi of Q squared, due to the Goldstone boson here, has a pole in Q squared. Now you can immediately see, without doing a very complicated work, that when you sum this, you sum all these things, and the number of time in the line, you get a geometric series. And the fact that you have a 1 over Q squared there shifts the 1 over Q squared by a quantity, making the 0 to be shifted, therefore, you have a mass, and this is the mass that you get that way while keeping the local symmetry untouched. And uh, you can generalize that, and we did it. To non-abelian symmetry, we get a non-abelian which is a bit more complicated. There are more this is, and I'm not going to discuss that for a moment, but that is, that's what it is. Now, this is mathematics, and I'm sorry for those who are not really in the field and may feel a little bit not at ease with this. But what does it mean? That's easy. What it means first, but before going into the detail of what it means, I want to stress that the absorption of the number goldstone boson here ensures by the fact that this thing here is, as I said, the word identity, ensures gauge invariance of the result and it shows by the singularity which appears here that the thing that you get the mass despite the fact that you keep gauge invariance. And also we did the following thing which is important for the final discussion I will do at the end of my talk that will show that we could also have a dynamical symmetry breaking. What does that mean? It means that instead of having the condensate by the boson itself you can have the condensate by something more complicated. Let's say, for instance, fermions, which compensate and things like that. And we showed that essentially the two properties which are there, that the, that the boson number goes to when the symmetry is local, gets absorbed, and we get again, it ensures gauge invariance and mass. Now, now we should now say, well, can we understand that in more simple language than having to go through the mathematics? The answer is yes. What is the fate of the Goldstone boson? What, what does the equation mean? Why, why has the, boson, uh, the Goldstone boson got, why did it got absorbed? Why? Well, let me first do what I said before. I play my game with uh, trying to show that because these blue spin are like the red spin, and if I do this, I get the Goldstone boson, right? So I take the condensate first, 
That's the first band, and then I do this, and then this, and so I get a Goldstone Bozo, right? Wrong. If the audience has seen why it's wrong, I would be delighted. Why is that wrong? Why, can, why is that not a Goldstone Bozo? No. I never get really the answer to this. Well, it's not complicated. The reason why it's wrong is that we have a local symmetry, so that's not an excitation. The locals don't bother. It makes no sense in a theory which has local symmetry. You can't have a Goldstone also, because if you do that, you are just redefining a new description of the vacuum. It's true that you turn around in the, uh, in the valley, but that is, uh, is just a redefinition of the vacuum. It's a redundant vacuum, but you have never had an excitation, so you can't have a goldstone both. It's as simple as that. But that put some time to understand completely that, I must say. So, this is a fictitious number goldstone ball. Why is that important? Well, that's the origin of the mass at the deeper level. Because massless field, we took gauge field, these are vector fields, which has polarization. But the ma massive field, of course, has obviously three directions of polarization, which we can have. But a massless field, actually, because of the Lorentz contraction, cannot have a third degree of polarization. There's only two. Right? That is, again, the reflection of two types of particles. So the fictitious Goldstone boson here disappears. But you had the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom don't disappear like this, so it has to be absorbed somewhere. Well, if it's absorbed somewhere, the only possibility is in the gauge field, because that's what it absorbs. The only way it can be done is to take a third degree of polarization in the, Goldstone ball, in the gauge field. But that's impossible for a massless gauge field, so the gauge field has to acquire mass. That's the origin of the mass. So it's, it's not that complicated at the end. From that diagram, you can understand that. And uh, so there's no degeneracy but a redundant description of the vacuum. Actually, it's Elitzur who gave a strict proof that it's impossible to break a local symmetry. So why do we say it's broken? Well, because it's convenient to our description to do that, particularly when we do perturbation theory, because we always thought that you could do that as being a broken symmetry, but fiction you sum the series, this is not the case. But that's convenient. So, as I say, there's no Goldstone boson, and they have been proved of that already in 64, by Higgs and then by Guralny, Hagen, and Kibble. But these proofs don't focus on the existence of this unique vacuum. They are done in a gauge-dependent way, but they are right. I mean, but they don't catch what I think is the essential of the problem. So the gauge field, as we said, acquire gauge invariant mass. That's the result of this absorption and the third degree of polarization. So now, this is easy to understand in the abelian case. In the non-abelian case, well, take three fields instead of two, so you have an SO3, you have like a sphere. And now suppose that you break it like like in the ferromagnetism, you still have an axis of magnetization. So you break SU3 through U1. The correct word is the coset space SU3 over U1. And uh, so if you look there, there are three gauge fields. But clearly, you can change the, uh, the uh, axis of magnetization, the U1, only in two ways. So that is doing this, this argument with, I did with this, I can only do it in two directions. So there are only two fictitious goals. So I can only use two to the third degree of polarization. So what I find here is that in this case, what will happen 
is that they will have two massive uh, gauge bosons or vector bosons and only one will remain massless. So the consequence of this is when you do it to the northern billion, you find that one, of course, each fictitious number boson boson yields a massive gauge field and then also that the BH mechanism unified short and long range forces. Now, what happens to the massive one? Well, nothing essentially, because this is a gauge invent. It's just a change of the um, of, of the modulus of the things and that doesn't depend on the on the gauge. So here it's represented in the phi one, but has nothing to do with the rotation. So that is gauge independent. So it's the same as the one of the Goldstone model, except, of course, that there is a coupling with the gauge field, which gives, even in the limit of semi-classical, a uh, possibility of a, uh, a semi-classical interaction. By that, we'll decide what that means. Just look the first diagram. And, put, and look it with the time, change the time, one can do that from left to right and remind that phi is, the, the full field is phi plus the fluctuation, which in the direction phi 1 is just the uh, BH boson. So here, oops, that's a little bit too fast. So we messed up that. And so it couples in, that's called a tree level, but that means it's the lowest uh, correction qu uh, quantum mechanically. Actually, it is classical, except that it's a amplitude. And uh, so you have uh, the Gaussian bonds, you have two possibilities. You replace one of the five by the fluctuation, or two of them, and you get easily these are the two possibilities by interaction without strong quantum effects. Strong quantum effects. But then, why have we done that? Why not start simply with a massive field, massive gauge field, and instead of a massless one, and then do all this complicated stuff to get a mass but not destroy the gauge field? As I said in the beginning, we know that quantum electrodynamics is consistent quantum mechanics, and in technical terms, it means it's renormalizable. Now, essentially what happens is that you could have this Q squared here, which at very large energy becomes very large, and therefore that term doesn't do something very terrible when you go to high energy. And that is related to the quantum validity of the problem. When you start doing things which uh, at large energy gets wild, then you have problems with quantum mechanics. And therefore, actually we suggested at that time in 67 that that theory should be renormalizable because it's too similar to quantum electrodynamics as far as the counting of the graph. But there's a catch. There's a catch because there's another pole there at Q squared when Q goes to zero. And in addition, the sign is not right. That I don't want to go into detail. But that means it's a ghost and would violate unitarity. Well, let's go to what Higgs has done. Higgs has done essentially the same thing, but has done it classically with the classical equation of motion. And he made a change, which was very clever, to take in the classical approximation the Goldstone boson, which is phi 2, to redefine the field into a new field B mu. Now, if I do the gauge field, this equation, which is there, is an identity. The identity is that one. You can check it's an identity. And that identity, you see, shows that this term here is a little bit troublesome because of this. But that term here is not troublesome, but gets 
while that large Q. So if you would take this, you would say the theory makes no sense because it's not. And that's what you would get if you would put the mass by hand, actually. That theory makes no sense because it's, it will not be renormalizable, it will not be quantum mechanically valid. And you would say that theory here makes no sense. What's happening? Oh, this is a bit dead. Oh, that is, it doesn't make sense because there's a fuel there that should not be there. But actually, what happens, of course, is that both made sense because these are just two changes of gauges, and you can always go from one to the other, and everything is contained in a second term, but I'm not going to discuss that in detail. So, this actually is what one calls a renormalizable gauge, and this is what Higgs, if he would have written it quantum mechanically, would have written, and it would be a gauge which is unitary. But the equivalence essentially suggests strongly that the theory is both unitary and, uh, and renormalizable by counting the powers. So that has been proven, and that's not trivial. How much time? Huh? Fine. So. Uh, so this is the theory. Um, <coughs> so this has, of course, to prove that two or order is a highly non-trivial thing. And that has been done by the Hoft and Weltmann, which got the Nobel Prize for it. And that's extremely important. That's why the theory is interesting. If that would not be true, you could take that theory and put it to the garbage pail. It, it would be. No interest at all, because now it's because this is true that you could go to corrections due to quantum mechanics and do detail and precision experiment is what has been done. And if that would not be the case, if the theory would not be renormalizable, in other words, if you would have started with putting by hand the masses, then you would end up with nothing interesting. And it turns out that this is interesting. We didn't have the fully, this of course, understood in the beginning, but it was in our motivation that somehow it should work. But it did work. Now, the application is the standard model. Standard model requires still another thing, is that you put mass to the fermions. That's very easy because the diagram I use are even simpler. They are these ones where you give this expectation value in the fermion propagation. And uh, actually, that was very well known by Nambu, actually. This is not something new. But the important, and, but, but nevertheless, but the important point is that once you do that, you get Nambu goes from boson. These were not seen. So that's why the further mechanism this thing was not used. Now, uh, I want just to make a remark now that uh, uh, the uh, uh, BH boson, which is here, the, which is the fluctuation of the phi, couples, of course, to the fermion the same way as the other Europe diagram uh, from by, uh, by the side. And uh, you see that it creates this. Now, Call lambda, this is you call the Yukawa coupling. Lambda phi is the mass. Therefore, lambda will be proportional to the mass of the fermion. And so this is very important because it couples the fermion of very high mass. And so you can find which are the pre predominant uh, disintegration later on on this. So this doesn't work because they're massless boson. But if you have the BH mechanism, then everything works because the massless boson becomes a third degree of polarization of the mass. Uh, gauge bosons, and then everything works. So the mass could follow actually without any of these local symmetries. It could follow all mass, but consistency requires the local symmetry to get rid of the goldstone boson. And so the BH mechanism can generate mass for fermions, that is for the elementary particles we have seen, interacting both with short-range and long-range interactions, short-range being those 
which have acquired a mass and long rate those which have not acquired a mass. Right? So this is the electromagnetic theory in a word. There, this is the group which has been used. It's a chiral group, meaning the S2 couples only to one of the uh, uh, neutrino components of the fermions. And uh, this contains two couplings. But we break it to some U prime one, which means that for the four gauge field which are there, S U2 has three gauge fields, U1 has one gauge field. For the three gauge field which are there, there's only three fictitious goldstone bosons. And so there will be three massive and one massless gauge boson, which of course you're going to identify to the photon. And uh, this is the way it works. And you can use the formula I've written down to compute in lowest order the masses. And this is what one finds with some modification which are due to the quantum correction, which is not computed in the formula I gave. And uh, this can couple to all the elementary particles. Actually, in the beginning, it was only the leptons, I mean, the mu and the electron, which were in the theory, so people were not so interested. But actually, Lasho, Kiyonomariani invented that showed that the quarks and actually the two first family were in the game. And Kawahashi Maskawa introduced the third one. And so all the, the particles which were in the previous uh, slides, which I showed you for the moment particle, everything is now coupled. The Z and the W has been discovered. And so one could say that the mechanism is actually very fast because this is done with all the quantum mechanical corrections and everything, and that works. And I don't know any other things which the quantum correction works and give rise to this group as you to cross you one. There is, I've left out the problem of the uh, strong interaction. Strong interaction is given by gluons as I said in the beginning, these don't get mass, but the force get channeled in another way. There is a connection, but I don't want, of course, we have a limited time. I don't want to discuss it, but I just want to say that the important point is that this is also a gauge field, s So we arrive to the full picture I said in the beginning. And now the question is, if it's really right in a simple way, it can be right in two ways. Can it be right with a fundamental uh, boson, fundamental scalar, or a composite one? That is a big difference in the issue. But here is the discovery. Right? Now, I'm not going to go going extremely fast here because you had already, if I understand, you had already a talk on the uh, experimental side, so I'm not going to try to repeat it in a bad way because I'm not an experimentalist. So, uh, so I'm not going to repeat it in a bad way, but uh, we have proton-proton interaction at very high energy. So the way you, you, give the, uh, you create the scalar boson is all these processes which are here, where you see the gluons are there, the vector boson. The most important one is the uh, gluon fusion, which is there, and also the vector boson fusion, which is there. But uh, I don't go in detail into that. The decay, we already have seen the decay in two massive uh, gauge bosons. Uh, there is also, of course, the decay into fermions, which because of the predominance of high mass will occur, if possible, in uh, the, uh, from the mm -hmm. highest one in the family, in the families. And finally, we should, after all, be careful, because we can also get a disintegration of photon. That cannot be obtained directly in the semi-classical way. That is genuine quantum effect, which is here by what calls loop. And uh, so you have these uh, disintegration into two gammas, 
which uh, play an extremely important role in the detection, actually. And they are important because, you see, because you have these loops which are essentially virtual pairs of charged particles, that could be sensitive to those even if you, you don't see. So these could be sensitive in principle to, to processes which are beyond the standard model. Now, all of them, if you do detailed correction, could be sensitive to that. But that's sensitive just in the lowest order. So now this has been done at CERN, and now I just just see, you know, CERN, what it is. You had the thing, I don't do it. The, 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 the big business there, with, uh, and with the 27 kilometers and all of that, with the big magnets, and you see. My cell phone? Ah, yeah, well, let's forget it. I don't know where it is. And, uh, yeah, oh, shit. Uh, okay, so uh, this, and then, of course, there are the detectors, and the detectors, uh, that is a nice one, it's the smallest one, but fine. Now, I'm not going to discuss this, just the nice data here, right, which is the, the integration to two Zs. Be careful, the, the two Zs don't conserve energy, so Z star means that this is a virtual Z. You, you see the disintegration of the Z, the final state, but not this intermediate state. But uh, you see that, and here is the thing. And that uh, the blue one is the background, including the one due to a single Z and two Z. And uh, so this is not the only thing measured, of course. They have measured all of this. And when you put, uh, you see that as far as the direct disintegration, the, the highest lepton was measured, and the highest one, which is available with energy conservation of the quark, is also detected. And the ratio of this to the standard model value is that it is consistent. So that means that maybe the standard model at this level of energy, which has been tested, is just what all what there is to it. And, uh, but uh, of course, there is room for error, so there is room for other things, but not so many at uh, these energies. And the important thing I want to discuss now to end up the talk is that this appears to be an elementary particle. All these diagrams which we have described are just local interaction. There are no known particle of uh, energies comparable for which this could be a uh, dynamical thing. So I consider, I think I'm ready to bet that this is an elementary particle. That doesn't mean at the Planck level it's elementary. I don't know. But at that level of energy, it should be elementary. And that's important. And now I want to briefly, finally, discuss the perspective of this. You see, one perspective is this. What are the consequences if it's elementary or not elementary? Well, you see, suppose you want to construct the world after all. Right. You decide to do that. Yeah, you construct the world. Why not? So you construct the world, and, uh, and you have the choice doing things one way or complicated, but let's assume that as me, that you are all lazy person, and you are going to try to do it with the least effort, right? So I will select the two possible way of constructing the world, which one which I call historic and the other which I call logic. Why? Well, the historic one is the one that, after all, you found this wonderful thing to get mass for gauge bosons, and uh, so you get this in the acquired mass. Now you ask, OK, the mass. do they do that dynamically, or do they, that, do, they do that uh, with elementary scalars? Well, elementary scalars, nobody has ever seen that. So you would think, well, uh, why not elementary? It turns out it's remarkably easy to do. So you do, and then you do say it's a composite massive scalar. It's, it's, for instance, 
the technical for blue want to know. But there are many ways. So this is the best way, probably. Very simple, nearly obvious. But uh, we know that, after all, you start with a chiral group. That's the assumption, SU2 cross U1, where SU2 acts only on the left. So to get the mass, you need to break the chiral symmetry. So you need to get the mass of the boson. If you start doing things in a dynamic way, then you want to do a dynamic way for the boson. And here is where you get tired, because that's difficult. That's very difficult. And the fermion requires mass. The fact that you want that to that the world becomes very complicated in the simplest way, which are anyway complicated, to have dynamical, new dynamical symmetry, higher things, and all horrible. But OK, if you are not tired, you can try to do that, especially. Then what would you find? Well, you would find probably the same type of thing as we said, but there's no particular reason that you should find the one which gives rise to the fermion at the same time as the other, right? So it's a little bit strange. Well, let's try to see. So that's what you would find essentially, perhaps. I don't know at which energy, by the way, probably higher, but maybe something happens and you have them there. So now let's say, OK, I will try to be a little bit more lazy. I will try to be more logical after all fermions. So simple to get mass. In, if I will do now, I will start with the fermion mass. Mass, I know they have a problem because I don't want this Nambu Goldstone boson. So, but it's so easy. It's, that is extremely complicated, but so easy with a scalar. And then I put an elementary massive scalar, and I have masses for the fermion. It's trivial Nambu, just from Nambu. It's, it's immediate, but of course, you have the Godstone boson. And that, for that, you have, even if it didn't exist, you have to invent the local symmetry to get rid of them. And then, if you do that, you're not going to complicate your life, because here you had a scalar boson. That was a big step. But that's the only way to avoid in this way to get into a mess. And then you use the same thing to get the local symmetry. As far as what you have here, then this thing should appear at the same time as it does, actually, in the uh, NHC. So what can we say? Well, here, if, you, if, if the historic thing would be true, we would have probably no reason for supersymmetry, which is something that uh, uh, occurs if you have some reason. There's no reason here. Everything is very smooth at all levels. It's very complicated. Here, maybe there's some supersymmetry expected, because you have invented scalar boson, and that is not a a normal type of thing that you would think precisely because it's easy to do it normally, as in solid state physics or as in think dynamically. So maybe it's expected, although I must say for the moment there's no indication at the LHC as far as I know. OK, so to conclude, I would say nature was lazy, and I think it shows the logic perspective. And I'm quite happy. And uh, so there's the last thing I want to say. Remember that we start with four type of interaction. Then came spontaneous symmetry breaking. And then we had the electroweak theory to do that. We had a strong interaction, which is not quite the same, but still a gauge field. So you could imagine that you could invent something called ground unification using again the same mechanism to do it. And then you stick with the fact that gravity has a lot of problems, dark matter, dark energy, inflation. I'm not going to discuss that, but the important problem is that we don't know how to quantize this, except if you believe in this horrible red thing it's called superstring and M theory, uh, which would solve the problem. So uh, that's all. And uh, just to get the story clear, these are the four papers that were 
written in 64. First one, the second paper is the one in which he gave this proof of the non-validity of the Goldstone theorem in the gauge field, and, uh, but in a gauge-dependent way. And uh, the third one is the one which he did in classical terms, the same mechanism. And finally, Duhalnik, Hagen, and Kibble gave a other description of the theorem for the absence of the Goldstone model. That's it. If you if you start doing saying it like this, that you're going to terrorize everybody, right? What, what? How do you manage with a quantum number? No. Can, can I just add something? There is a theorem that at low energy, Dilaton looks exactly like a So it's indistinguishable. You, could you distinguish it if once you try to measure the tension? Yeah, sure. 